Today I will talk about some best practices when doing performance testing using Learner Cloud. And I will start a little bit at the bottom, so to say, with some general tips around performance testing before going into more Learner Cloud specific items. It might be that you already know all of this, and that would be great. But if not, I do hope that you pick up something new during this presentation here today. So if we start with some general ideas around why we should use best practices. So if you want to get the best results from your testing, you need to know what exactly your objectives and goals are. Like, for example, the expected number of concurrent vertical users or the required transactions per second. Because if you do start your testing without knowing those things, it can be hard to get good results or even getting the results that you need. So it's important to plan the testing properly, and in doing so, hopefully then do the testing right the first time around, so that you don't have to rerun the same tests over and over due to, let's call it, bad planning. And by following best practices, it should hopefully minimize many testing issues and that you'll get the results that you need from your testing. In this presentation, we like to say that simplified, there are normally five phases in the general test cycle, and we will cover these phases here today. And we'll start with planning. First off, we need to be able to answer the question why we are running our tests, and also to understand the purpose behind our performance testing. Of course, performance testing is an umbrella term for a large number of non-functional tests, so in order to get the most out of our performance testing, we need to be aware of the different types of tests available to us, so that we can select the most suitable ones for our testing purposes. And if we look at a number of examples of why, it can, for example, be to, to see how the system behaves under normal load, or how it reacts to stress, and if the system does fail, will it recover, and how does it recover? We also need to understand why a test has been set up in a particular way, because again, if you do not know why you are running the test, then you probably don't know what to expect to gain from running it either. Then we should also know, or at least be aware of, what type of results we would ex expect from a test in order to be able to interpret them correctly. Meaning that you shouldn't really use the results from a normal load test to try to claim that there are no memory leakages in the system, since you would need to run a much longer endurance test for that. So once we know and understand the why we do our testing, we can then proceed to the how do we do our testing. A general rule around how we design our performance test is that it should reflect realistic load conditions for specific reasons, and not just everything at once. And in particular, parallel functional testing should be avoided, which can often be the case when people simply use any old business processes from their functional testing, and then try to use those for the performance testing. So that means that the business processes used for the scripting should be specifically made for performance testing, and they should reflect the real-world usage of the system. Basically, if you look at how a normal standard user will navigate through the system, that need to be a script which is part of the performance testing. And keep in mind that most performance testing goals can be achieved with a handful of business process scripts, and We've run tests against large online retail sites in the past, simulating the real-world behavior of our customers with just a small number of scripts. So once you know and understand your testing goals, there are many different types of tests that, can, that you can run, and all with different load profiles and durations. So to give some examples, you have the standard load tests for validation, which will validate if the system can handle the expected load, you can also run regular regression tests, so that each time a new version of a system has been released, you can run a test to make sure that there is no regression of performance in the new build. Then you have your endurance and performance degradation tests, where you see how the system reacts to a sustained load over a long period of time, which is then often used to check for memory leaks and similar, for example. You also have the stress and scalability tests, where you check how the system reacts when you go far beyond any expected load levels. And then also, if it breaks, will it recover? And maybe then, how it, will it recover? So all of these tests are to be used in different situations. So depending on your goals, make sure to run the suitable type of tests. 
Getting the load levels correct in your testing is of course important, and the best data for, for this often comes from existing production data. So by looking at that, you can then figure out what are the key business transactions in your systems. For example, a customer buying an item, which should also be reflected by a name transaction in your scripts. Then check how often those transactions are executed during the busiest hour of the month. And that will then give you a good start for the 100% peak transaction per second load. And it will, also, it will also provide a rough estimate for suitable think times and pacings when you do those calculations for the transactions. That same exercise, or by using estimated business data, can then also provide details around how to distribute the load among the different scripts in a test as well, since, for example, more users will simply browse around on a retail site than actually buying anything, unfortunately. And what's more, by looking at existing production or estimated business data, can also help with deciding on the total number of other users to be used in the test, since, as you know, one other user running very fast can reach the same total transactions per second as 100 other users running very slow. But from a system point of view, it can have a very different effect due to the concurrency of the running other users. It can also be that even if there is a large number of other users in total, that the number of them actively navigating a business process at the same time can be lower, which can then be solved by using pacing or think times at the end of the business process. It can also be that you know how many active server threads are, there are in production, so that you should then make sure that your test recreates a similar number of threads for validation, just to make it comparing apple to apple later on. So in general, make sure to try to use as much existing production data as possible to see what is applicable for you. And we also recommend using a bit of randomization of the think times and the pacing in order to help spreading out the load during a test, so that if any peaks or troughs occur in the transactions per second during the duration of the test, maybe due to a too short ramp up, those will then hopefully go away over time. Let's now have a look at some scripting best practices. There are quite a few expectations from well-written scripts, and they should capture essential, but not all, business processes, since usually 80% of the load comes from 20% of the real-world business flows, so we do not need to test every nook and cranny. The scripts should also have a variation in the test parameter data to create a realistic load simulation, and by keeping the scripts as simple as possible while still doing the jobs, they will then hopefully be easy to maintain as well. They should also use proper transactions so that the response times are measured correctly for the different user actions in the scripts, and with a proper contents check so that we know that the scripts are doing what we expect them to do. So if we look at some of those best practices in a script, I'll make use of a VUDN script here, and while this script is just an example, it is still based on some real-world scripts that uh, I've used in the past, and I'll use it to point out a few of the best practices here. Transaction names are usually displayed in an alphabetical order in the graphs and the tables, so with this naming convention, where I use a prefix of the script number, and then the order number of the transaction, and by doing that, they will then be grouped by script number and transaction order in all of the graphs, which then makes them a lot easier to read and interpret. We like to set think times to 10 seconds uh, in order to enable easy to calculate manipulations in the random settings to hit a certain TPS, since those are done by percentages. So if I want the script to use a random think time between 5 and 10 seconds, I then set those to 50 and 150%, keeping the things simple. We try to keep all code inside of named transactions, and this is so that if an error happens, it will result in a failed transaction as well. Of course, the error counter will also rise, but if it's not inside a transaction, the test might still get flagged as passed, and if one only looks at the passed and failed transactions, they might simply miss this. So if all code is inside transactions, 
it will then be better flagged up. The use of unique verification points is, is to, do, to verify that each transaction does what we expect it to do, so that if a transaction fails, we know that that's actually where in the flow where the issue occurred and not anywhere earlier. Make use of dynamic verification points. And this is so that we can verify that any response or calculation that is unique for the running virtual user is correct and not just using static data that will be the same for all running virtual users. So here in this example here, we are checking that the quote number that has been created earlier in the script is still the expected one and that we aren't working on a different quote belonging to a different virtual user. And make sure to limit any loops uh, that you're using to a max number of iterations, since if some error occur, your loop condition might never come true, meaning that the virtual user would continue to loop forever. So by using a loop counter and a limit, we know that the loop will always exit at some point, and if a loop limit is triggered, we can then have a suitable error message. And that brings me to the next point here, which is informative error messages, which, uh, which enables for easier troubleshooting after the test, so that we have a nice list of all failures, which then can be followed up upon afterwards. Now, if your scripts are using parameterized test data, the more variation in that is usually better. And we, we can differentiate between non-consumable and consumable data, and we need to provide as much consumable data for your test as required, but we shouldn't go overboard and have like data for 10 hours in a one hour test. And this is then simply to avoid large parameter files, which can slow things down. And if your tests are to be repeated, it might be that you need to take a snapshot of the application database before the test, and then to restore the database to the same state after every test. And this is then in order to be able to compare the test results with each other, simply due to if the database has a different size or a different amount of data in it, that might then skew the results between the tests if we are not restoring the database. All right, so let's continue with configuration here. And some general tips to look out for are that if you are, if you, or if you have project management enabled in Learn Cloud, to not only make sure that enough licenses are allocated to them, but also that the correct type of license, either the user or the user hours, is assigned to the different projects. And while doing so, you can also disallow certain projects from using the Vita user hours licenses if these are to be reserved for certain projects, so that they aren't used up by mistake when the standard virtual user license could have been used. And if multiple levels of load are required, then the functionality of add virtual users can be used to literally add more virtual users once the preset ramp up has finished. An alternative is also to use the pause scheduling feature to make regular pauses during the ramp up. And these two features are then enabled on the general tab of the test. And if you are making use of global transactions, meaning transactions with the same name in different scripts, then the group transactions feature can be enabled in the settings to allow for those transactions being reported into the one same named transaction. And finally, when uploading a script for the first time, you, you use the upload button, but if you are uploading a new version of an existing script, then use the reload button because otherwise your script will be uploaded under a new name, basically just with a number added to it instead. So if we look at the ramp up pace of the Vata users, always start slowly and build up the load over a longer period of time, since this can often give an early indication if anything starts to act in a problematic fashion. And too often are people ramping up way too fast, and then they are surprised that the application fell over. But if you do ramp up slowly and observe how the application on the test is reacting with the increasing load, then you might gain some indication around at exactly what level of load that any issue started to appear, which then might make the troubleshooting and the tuning of the AUT a lot easier to do later on. So again, if you do run into issues early on in the, during a test, uh, 
try to repeat the test but with an even slower ramp up pace and then also keep an eye on the behavior of the AUT during the ramp up. If you run a test for the first time, always keep an eye on it since it is likely that there will be errors and if not observed this can spiral a bit out of control. Also if you are to run a test unobserved, this should really be a test that has been executed in the past without any issues. If there is one rule or best practice that is the most important one, it is this. Make sure to disable all logging, even on error only. And this is to avoid causing issues during a test, and especially if using on-premises load generators, since the results might become very large if extended logging has been used, which might then also lead to a lack of disk space on the load generators and thus jeopardizing the whole test. And always make sure to use realistic think times and pacing, not only in order to hit your targets, but also to avoid unnecessarily stressing the CPU and the load generators themselves, especially if running a large number of other users. And this can then easily be observed by using the resource monitors for the load generators. And the use of continuum error should only be used where it makes sense. So if the business process consists of a series of steps that all need to pass after each other, then don't use it, since if one of those steps will fail, then the rest of the steps will also fail, causing unnecessary amounts of error data. But if, you are, if your steps are separate from each other, for example by just hitting different URLs, then the use of continuum error makes sense. Regarding dedicated IP addresses, there are two use cases. The first one is if your testing is done using cloud load generators and your application on a test is behind a company firewall. Then the use of dedicated IP addresses for the cloud load generators is often required. Now, since most organizations usually need some time to allow certain IP addresses in through the firewalls, this setup needs to be done in advance. So to request dedicated IP addresses, please open a ticket with the SAS support. The second use case is if you're using on-premises load generators, since these need to be able to communicate with the Learn on Cloud runtime control components in the cloud. So here you might also need to use dedicated IP addresses throughout the testing cycle for the runtime components, uh, if you have a restrictive firewall between the load generators and the internet. And of course, both of these use cases are outlined in the online help for you. If you want to use on-premises load generators, the installation file is available from Learn on Cloud in the Get Tools widget on the dashboard. And nowadays, the whole Load on family are using the same installer called the 1LG. So during the installation, you simply select for which product to install. This also means that if you need to use or connect the load generator to a different product, you can simply then just rerun the installation and select which product you want to use. The requirement for an on-premises load generator is that the machine can connect to the Learn on Cloud URL over port 403, outgoing only, in the firewall. That connection can either be directly or over a proxy if required. A simple way to test this connectivity from the on-premise load generator is to either run a telnet to that URL or try to access it through a browser. And it should then connect successfully. Uh, but if not, you will then have to check with your network team. If you are using cloud load generators, then you don't have to care about how many load generators are assigned to your test since this is then calculated automatically. But when using on-premises load generators, you then need to estimate how many load generators are needed for your test. So it might be that you'll need to run a sizing exercise to see how many better users you can run on one of your on-premises load generators. For example, by setting up a test as planned, but then only run it on one LG and slowly ramp up until you hit around 80% resource utilization on the on-premise load generator. And that is then a rough number of how many better users you can run per load generator, which can then be extrapolated into how many are required in total. Now let's go into the execution phase here. And as mentioned earlier, we always recommend that pauses are held during the ramp up of a test. Uh, basically in order to make sure that the application on a test is stable when the load doesn't change. And this can either be preset by staggering the ramp up as displayed here, or if you want to do it manually, then the pause ramp up feature can be enabled in the general settings for the load test, which then makes it easy to perform pauses when required.
The reason for doing this process during the ramp up is to observe and to make sure that the AUT stays stable during the pause, meaning that the transaction response times and transactions per second remain on the same level, since there is no increase in load. But if the AUT is showing signs of not being stable while the load is kept on the same level, then you know that there might be a bottleneck here somewhere that you will need to investigate. And this also ties back to the use of a slow ramp up so that you can try to catch any issues as early as possible, since it might be easier to find a bottleneck when you only have 10 virtual users in the system compared to 100 or even 1000 virtual users. If we need to adjust the maximum load during a test, which can be done once the initial ramp up has finished, that can be done with the use of enabling adding virtual users during test run which will then allow you to increase or decrease the load during a test. The one caveat is that we have to define how much additional load will be available to us before the test is started, which is done by using a percentage of the initial maximum load. And to do so, once the original ramp up has finished, we can click the change load button when it comes to be enabled and adjust the load accordingly. The previous ramp up pace will then be used for this next ramp up or ramp down again. Once that change in load has finished, another adjustment in total load is once again possible if required. Okay, so let's have a look at the final phase, the analysis. And if we start with some tips around the analysis in Learn Cloud, the, the dashboard works in a way that you expand the tree of measurements and select the ones you would like to see or compare in the selected graph. But what many users miss is that you can also right click on, for example, the transaction response times average header, and then select to show all transactions, locations, or emulations without having to click through and select them one by one, which I did initially. The dashboard supports tabs that you can rename, and they are also persistent. So if you create and configure a couple of tabs, they will still be there when you later on return to the revisit them. And this is also then tied to the logged in user. So you won't change what any of your colleagues see when they check the same results that they might have configured differently. Finally, it's also possible to select a previous result as a comparison to the current runs, which is done by clicking and selecting the compare button, which then results in that measurement from both runs are seen in the same graph widget. In Learn on Cloud, there is something called uh, anomaly detection, and that is when a measurement significantly changes its expected behavior. For example, if a response time suddenly spikes up or similar, that would then raise an anomaly flag. And if we click on that, it will show in which graph and when it happened. And in the bottom graph here, the light blue area is the expected behavior of the measurement according to the built-in detection algorithm. So when the response time suddenly increase at the three minute mark, that is then when the anomaly detection is, was triggered and the flag was raised. And we can also see how the light blue area then later on adapted itself to a new expected behavior. And if the measurements then would move outside of that new area, another anomaly flag would then be raised. So these anomalies is a way to quickly identify if there were any outliers or any other unexpected events going on in the load tests without going into deeper details of it. And finally, if we have defined SLA values for our transactions in the test, they will also be detected and flagged up during the test if they are breached. And using SLAs is normally recommended because they will provide a quick feedback and an easy way to judge if a test was deemed to be successful or not which can also be of extra value if a test is part of a DevOps toolchain, which runs automatically. So in the graph here, we can see from the dotted line that our SLA is set to 10 seconds. So those small red spikes seen there are then the SLA breaches and are thus flagged up as such. It is also possible to set up a test so that if an SLA fails, then the test automatically stops and it is indeed flagged as failed. And with that, we've come to the end of this presentation. So I thank you for your attendance and I hope that this session was beneficial to you.